Daniel, are you ready? The Columbus City Council meeting for February 1st, 2021 will now come to order. In compliance with the Open Meeting Act, Nebraska Revised Statute 84-1407, a current copy of this act is posted in this meeting room. Madam Clerk, would you please call roll? Bulkley? Here. Augustine Schulte? Here. Barr? Here. Hemer? Here. Jablonski? Here. Creshaw? Here. Lohr? Here. Roth? Here. Schilling? Here. Mayor Bulkley, the roll has been called. Thank you. Mrs. Council President. Our Father, thank you for the opportunity to serve our fellow citizens. Please give us your wisdom and guidance to make the proper decisions entrusted to this governmental body. May our conduct show respect, honor, and courtesy to each other, as well as to all our citizens. Amen. Amen. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. Welcome everyone to tonight's council meeting. If at any time during our meeting anyone in our audience would like to address the council, we'd ask you please come forward, give your name, address, and we'd ask that you try to limit your comments to five minutes or less. I'd like to just point out, if you think things are a little different tonight, we're having some internet problems, so we're kind of working the old-fashioned way with paper. Uh, we are able to put uh, the agenda on the screen so you can follow along with us, but we are not able to use our computers as of right now. All right, we'll start with the consent agenda. Item four, consent agenda. The following items are considered to be routine by the city council and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a city council member or citizen so requests, in which event the item will be removed from consent status and considered in its normal sequence on the agenda. Item 4A, minutes of the January 18th, 2021 city council meeting. Item 4B, resolution number R21-10, amending the bylaws of the Board of Park Commissioners to change the meeting dates from the third Tuesday of the month to the first Tuesday of the month. Item 4C, resolution number R21-11, approving the use of Pawnee Park to camp overnight on Friday, June 11th and Saturday, June 12th, 2021 for the annual antique tractor and gas engine show. Item 4D, resolution number R21-12, approving the Highland Park Church second edition final plat redevelopment agreement and bringing portions of said edition into the corporate limits. Item 4E, resolution number R21-13, amending the personnel manual with regard to holiday pay, compassionate leave, and accrual of vacation and sick time. Item 4F, payroll and bills on file. Mr. Mayor and Council, is there anything you would like removed from consent status? Mr. Mayor, I move that uh, the items in the presented in the consent agenda be approved. Second. Motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by aye. Those opposed, nay. Aye. 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 Aye.
For the other items? For the other items, okay. Yeah, that was a unanimous vote. Okay. <laughs> Motion passes. <laughs> Special presentations. Item 6A, annual report of the library board and community building project update. Hello, I'm Karen Connell. I'm the library director. Okay, so we'll start with the annual report. October 2019 through March 15th, 2020 was the start of a typical fiscal year for the Columbus Public Library. As usual, the library was a bustling place hosting weekly and monthly programs for all ages. The library then followed the lead of local schools and closed to the public on March 16th, 2020 in response to COVID-19. Our services during COVID-19 shutdown included access to reading material and information via our digital library resources, phone and email assistance for digital library access and reference questions, <coughs> a print and mail service for patrons who needed the library's computer lab for printing documents, and contact-free curbside service was launched April 9th. That was used 662 times in May and June. The City of Columbus offered a grocery order and delivery program through Columbus Hy-Vee during April, May, and June. Library staff assisted employees from other city departments with placing and delivering orders. The library building reopened June 22nd with limited hours and services, which continue to fluctuate based on local health guidelines and the statewide directive health measures. Before closing the library in response to COVID-19, library engaged with the community to relaunch a project to build a new library and community building. This project, of course, expanded into that community building as we um, conducted surveys. After a successful educational campaign, voters approved issuing bonds for the community building on November 3rd, 2020. Rural Platte County residents voted to end library and bookmobile services to rural residents. Further details of the results of this election and the consequences thereof will be reported in next year's summary as it falls in the 2020, 2021 fiscal year. So overall, the library had a positive impact this year in the lives of our community members. Countless library patrons expressed their gratitude when curbside service began and when the library building opened so they could once again access entertainment and educational resources. This year had its difficulties, of course, but we were glad to be a part of making it a little bit more bearable for our community. Whether it was finding the perfect books and movies to entertain the kids so mom and dad could work at home or bringing joy to someone's lonely summer without their grandchildren. The library continued to serve the community in quiet, impactful ways. Those moments fulfill our mission to connect people with ideas, something we did every day and we thank Columbus for another fantastic year. So let's take a look at the statistics for this fiscal year. And Janelle, that's that PDF that you had open earlier. Sorry about that. Okay, so starting at the top with finances, shown here are the actual monies received and expended. The city of Columbus spent $1,070,000 to provide library services to the community from October 1st of 2019 to September 30th of 2020. Platte County spent just under 122,000. Their contract with the city for the 2019-2020 fiscal year uh, is for $150,000, but since their fiscal year is different than ours, the numbers don't quite line up for this report. They did pay a large amount in the fall and that will show up on next year's annual report. <clears throat> Looking at the expenditures, they're down over $145,000 from the previous year, mostly due to furloughing seven of our part-time library staff while the library was closed during April, May, and June. We purchased about the same amount of materials as the previous year, although this year more was spent acquiring digital library materials than before. You can see a breakdown of expenditures for the library collection uh, in that materials expenditures graph in the center of the page. So next, let's look at the circulating collection. That's the green section on the bottom right. These are the numbers of items available for checkout in various formats. On the bookshelf graphic, 
you can see that on September 30th, 2020, when we do all these counts, we held 54,000 print books, 2,400 audiobooks, and 6,000 DVDs. The collection of ebooks and e audiobooks grew significantly due to a migration of materials from one company to another. RB Digital, which held a lot of our e materials, was purchased by Overdrive, which is actually our main ebook platform. So the items we owned in a shared collection were now counted towards our holdings as an individual collection. On the bottom left of this page, I have listed various items in our special collections. The majority of these items are used in the library building. Some of them are part of the makerspace, such as the laser engraver, the 3D printer, embroidery machine, vinyl cutter, and poster printer. On the next page, the use of library services is detailed. Checkout of materials is only one part of library services. Those numbers are in pie graphs at the top of the page, showing a total of over 146,000 checkouts. Physical materials are still used more than electronic, but that didn't, number did increase this year by about 10,000 checkouts, um, mostly when, we were, when the building was closed and people were using our online materials. In the middle of the page on the right, a stack of books displays the use of interlibrary loan. That's a program where libraries share materials with each other for our patrons to check out. So our patrons borrowed 827 items from other libraries, and we loaned 585 items to other libraries for their patrons to use. So due to the, the COVID-19 pandemic, all the statistics in the bottom left box labeled facility and the bottom right section for library programs are less than last year. However, uh, we are thankful that our library has been able to serve the community much more than others. In some cities, the public libraries are still closed, whereas we've been able to be open since the end of June and even offer limited programming while still following those recommended health measures. So thank you for your continued support of your public library. Any questions about the annual report? Yeah. When does the bookmobile end for the county? So right now the contract will expire on June 30th. Anything else? Okay, so Mayor Bulkley asked me to also present a progress update regarding the community building project. So right now, BVH Architecture is working on the city hall program. That's determining how many square feet are needed, the number of offices and adjacencies of departments or even employees within departments. They are also working on the library program with the help of Margaret Sullivan Studios that's a library design firm, and adjacencies of the various entities and components in the, in the whole building. The next steps will be reviewing potential changes to floor plan adjacencies, and um, when we get to the stage of more detailed design, different stakeholder groups like the Arts Council will be brought in. Boyd Jones Construction is working with them along the way to establish costs and make sure we stick to that budget that we've set. The Library Foundation is also at work. They're helping out with that project budget, starting again with their fundraising. They're contacting donors right now who were interested in giving prior to the failed 2017 bond vote. Those donors wanted to wait until public funding was secured. So now that it has been, meetings are being set up and uh, just to get them up to date on the project and discuss their donation. There's about 10 local businesses on that list and 10 Nebraska or Midwest foundations that typically give to these sorts of projects. So far, the Library Foundation has raised just about $5 million. So with those 20 potential donors, I have no doubt they'll raise an additional $3 million by the summer of 2023. And those um, 10 local businesses are, are ones that ex specifically expressed interest last time around. So there's definitely more that can be reached out to if we need to. Uh, in regards to the library, Following your approval of the bid from Boyd, Boyd Jones Construction this evening, work will begin tomorrow to re, um, make all the necessary changes we need to in this building so it can function as a library. Replacing torn carpet, adding smoke detectors, 
um, lighted exit signs, and an additional source of egress are a few of those safety updates that are needed. The work should take no more than four weeks. So we're planning for Friday, February 26th to be our last day open in the current building. The next day, uh, following the vehicle auction, we will auction furnish, uh, furniture and fixtures that we won't be using in this temporary library or storing for use in the new library. So then two weeks after that, that'd be March 1st through the 12th, we'll be moving furniture, supplies, shelving, and books to this temporary library. Von Rensel Movers has been hired to move the shelves and the books and any furniture and boxes that we don't end up moving ourselves. Then on Monday, March 15th, we plan to open to the public in the temporary library building. Um, at that time, we hope to return to our pre-COVID open hours since this building should require fewer staff to keep an eye on the various areas than our current building. And being a smaller space, fewer patrons will be able to come at any given time. So more open hours will allow people to space out their visits. The library will offer most of the same services as we do now, just in a different way. In the temporary building, patrons will be able to access materials for checkout, read magazines and newspapers, use the public computers and makerspace equipment, and attend programs. Some of the library collection will be housed in the partial basement here where staff can retrieve items for those patrons, similar to how we did curbside service in the spring when the library building was closed. Programs will be held here in council chambers and in the conference room behind me, as well as off-site. For example, we have a music program scheduled in March and it will be held at the Friedhof building. And our summer programs for children and families are planned to be held at Frankfurt Square. So it's a busy and exciting time for the library. Lots going on. Any questions about that part, the update? No? Okay. Thank you very much, Karen. Awesome. You keep up the good work, and uh, we'll, we've got lots of things happening with our library over the next we couple do. of months. Yes, we do. And I think the public, one, one comment the public would, no, would notice if they're downtown is the parking lot mm -hmm. to just to the west of us here, straight south of the library. The south half of it as of now is partitioned off and mm -hmm. closed for the construction. Correct. And at some point, Two weeks, three weeks later, or it, it maybe more once the demo. Of okay, somewhere in the near future, yeah. the whole parking lot will mm -hmm. be closed, and it will be a staging area for construction of the new library and the demo and the demolition of the old library. Probably the way we're doing it gives people a chance to recognize and get used to. Hey, we're not going to have this parking mm -hmm. lot for a while. Yeah. You know, it's it's some of that short term pain for the long term gain, and uh, we're going to have to. We've got to live with that to get what mm -hmm. we want to get. Yep, we keep telling ourselves only two years, only two years, so we can do it. So, thank right. you, Karen. Thank you. <clears throat> Item 6B presentation from Public Works Director on snow removal. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Chuck Slibus, City of Columbus, Director of Public Works. Uh, we're just going to go over the snow plowing procedures. Uh, we've had some changes, and I'll just go over real quick. The first thing I do want to say is all this information is available on the city website, ColumbusNebraska.com. Uh, you go down and scroll through. You go to Street Department or go to Public Works, then go to and scroll down to Street Department, and then this information is under snow plowing. It'll all pop up. So... Basically, uh, you know, it's our priority to get the snow moved within 12 to 24 hours of the event. Uh, we start, uh, you know, prior to the snow, depending on the forecast, we may pre-treat with de-icing agents if needed. If there's not going to be no rain or freezing rain prior to that, uh, that always helps uh, to uh, pre-treat. So that's part of the process. Uh, once we do have a snow event over two inches, uh, we'll uh, dispatch the crews out and they'll do the thoroughfares, collector streets, emergency routes are given first priority. Crews then proceed into the residential areas, uh, then cul-de-sacs, and then alleys. Alleys are usually the last to be um, done. Uh, if you want to go to the next page. 
or slide. Uh, this is basic, just question and answers, and I'll go through just a few of them, but here again, all this is available on the city website. Uh, there's some good, good information on there. Uh, here again, it's just when's the crews start plowing, uh, basically two to six inches, the crews will be out. Uh, normally be prior to two inches is just pre-treatment, uh, things of that nature. Uh, two inches is where we dispatch all the crews and go out in full force normally. There again, depends on weather conditions, wind, uh, things of that nature. It's all pretty much basic, you know, the forecast and timing of the events, a lot of it. So I think for the most part, our biggest is gonna be the snow routes we've increased, but um, so I'm gonna get into the snow emergency. Uh, what's a snow emergency? When a, the mayor or the public works director declares an emergency, it simply means vehicles may not be parked on streets where you see emergency snow routes. We have all those established now, all the signs are posted. Uh, we have a list on the website, we have an interactive map, and we'll see that here a little long, later in the slides. Uh, but. The basic thought process is behind this. We went from two streets prior to this to we got several streets, several avenues now. Uh, if we declare a snow emergency, uh, no vehicles would be parked on that street. Uh, we have the ability to tow immediately. That gives us another tool in the toolbox if needed. Uh, a lot of these streets are already non, you know, no parking or main thoroughfares and everything. So uh, it looks overwhelming at first when you look at the map when you see all the red lines but uh, the thought was that in a snow event that's really heavy hard snow a lot of snow eight inches or more heavy winds ice rain uh, things of that nature we will uh, you have to travel maybe three to four blocks in either direction to get to a plowed street that will try to keep open through that whole event all right next slide this just kind of established what I just said that, uh, you know, the mayor or the director, we can uh, call the emergency snow route. And uh, the list, you'll see the list, you'll see the map, but we can declare any street. We can declare downtown no parking. We can declare, you know, that's kind of at our given needs that, you know, we have some things in writing, but some of it will be just announced and you know it depends what's going on or you know if there's other underlying issues that we need to address we can you know it's just you can't say that well eight streets a snow route well yeah it is but we could add six seventh and ninth if we had to or we needed to so uh, on this one here it's just you got 24 hours um, within the snow event to uh, clean sidewalks and things of that nature. Uh, this next slide will be the list. This will just be the basic list we'll work off. These are the designated snow routes that when we have to announce this, uh, this will be part of the announcement or part of the paper notice or our online notice or any of our web pages. This will be the notice. And you can see here we went from two streets basically to 24 streets and 20 avenues that are now declared and marked as snow routes. So on this next slide, you'll see, uh, this is the uh, interactive page where you go on here and you can click on any of them red lines, just gonna tell you what that street is. So up north, that's 38th Street, you'll see 48th Avenue, but that way it's a little easier to see because the map was kind of small. We can't get a huge big map on the uh, internet to uh, on our web pages, so that's how we addressed it. So. All those red marks are designated snow routes. So, and you see when we get down south, 11th Street still on there, uh, 9th Street 10, or 10th Street, but not knowing, you know, the construction and the completion and how the flow would go with the uh, new Vidoc and everything. That's why we put those in there just so we get them posted and they're in there. Chuck, so, you mentioned a lot about snow emergency. When was the last snow emergency in the city of Columbus? We declared one last year, I think, it, and then it scared it away. We never had the snow, so it works really well. It's a good tool to have. We <laughs> hope it works that way every time. But, you know, this last 8-inch one, uh, the timing of it, you know, we were on the fence. If the winds would have been 
heavier and you know then they dropped it down to five then they went back up to eight to twelve and it kind of bounced around but you know we we watch four or five different weather stations and it's a hard game to play but timing is a lot of it so you know when we they said it was going to stop around nine or ten and it, it did so we figured well we're going to do downtown and then we'll get in the residential area it worked fairly well except we had some breakdowns we had uh, some unavailability of the bigger trucks to haul so that's why the, some of the windrows were downtown the next following day uh, but that's just you know we worked through it and tried to get through it so but and then this last page is just if you have a hydrant on your block or on your corner just a common courtesy for the fire department uh, to scoop it out and clean it if it's buried so they can see it and it's visible uh, we like to see that done we used to have the scouts do it once in a while they'll go through and pick them up and stuff but um, you know like I says everything I went through it really quick tried to keep it short all the information is on the website if you know anybody has questions they can call and we can try to get you the answers on those main through affairs how often do you go up and down those as needed they uh, you know some of the main roads through town they were on them three or four times in a day you know they, they'll just know, my street run did, it was like four or five times that yeah. they come by. and it depends you know this time with the school being canceled you know we watch it that too that's a big uh, part of it if there's no school that kind of makes things a little easier for the crews too that you know we don't have to get in them areas right away and make all those roads passable to the schools so that's all part of that big picture Chuck, some of the new construction roads are, are there's some of those that we don't treat because of new construction we uh and if so we, sorry okay go so, ahead do we do we list that on the website but we could put them on there they're not on there now but they're marked at, on the streets themselves and we did put a list out on our uh one of our web pages but we can't put some brine we just can't put the full strength on them but it's kind of up to the contractor because they got a warranty that worked for a year but uh, the contractors we've had been pretty easy to work with and stuff on the vidox and things of those nature we we if we have to we can put the sand gravel mixture uh, no salt but we can use some uh, brine treatments on them okay. thank you so two questions Chuck the 24-hour rule applies to rec to sidewalks all over town that's correct. correct so residential business any sidewalk in the city that is correct should try to get cleaned after 24 hours yep, 24 hours after the end of the event I mean, that is you know that's a common question we get every year from people uh, so we really need our residents and our businesses to recognize the fact that after a major snow we, you know yeah the streets are getting clean but then we need some help getting the sidewalks clean especially you know you got kids going to school you got people that you know traverse these sidewalks on a regular basis so that's one thing I think it's important to get out to recognize we have to we have to get that done we've really never made an effort to seriously enforce that and I don't think that's something we want to do but it's certainly possible that it could right. happen if we get into one of those really snowy years and people aren't obeying and you know not trying to step forward and do what needs to be done yeah because if the, if you're a property owner and you got a sidewalk adjacent to your property or on your property that's the responsibility is you as a property owner to clear it or make a path through it within that 24-hour time now then that leads me into the the age-old question and you knew it was coming i can tell mm -hmm. by your snicker so why do you why do you put snow back on my sidewalk after i cleared it <laughs> we don't we don't put snow on your sidewalk intentionally we don't single people out no, but in some I, cases and that practice of being sidewalks right along the curb in some areas john in your area that that's not a practice right. anymore there's a setback but uh you know we have one most of our equipments are one-way plows and that says it's just exactly what it is one way we can only go one way and that's to the curb and there's really no logical or uh, tool out there that makes fiscal sense for a municipality you know they got these blades that drop down on them and hold them off the street but you know when you got a house or a driveway every 60 feet it's just not practical it slows your machine down and you have issues getting stuck and uh, you know we try we can control some of it you know we know there's a sidewalk there we'll try to gear it down and go slow we don't go out there purposely to plug people's driveways or uh, plow their sidewalks closed it's just it's the nature of the beast it's we have really no choice I wish there was an answer and I had a couple people up in my office with it but you know after talking to them explaining how it works there's you know there's we just 
you know, to get through the town and the timeline we want to do and what people expect, we can't, we can't just stop and, you know, clean driveways and, and do that. So, I mean, I, I got the same problem. I come to work, go out, come home and scoop mine before I leave. I come home and there's another pile of my driveway. Go to work the next day. They're making their second round, and guess what? There's another pile. Well, they got your address in the truck, when they just got to keep well, that. Well, <laughs> it might be intentional in my driveway. I don't know. It seems awful deep, but I hope not. Well, I, I, we all know that is a common question. Everyone in this room has either gotten or, or or has heard somebody bring up, and I think it's important that we hear from you, that you know how impractical it is, and I think it's upon us to try to let the citizens know. Yeah, hey, we don't do that intentionally and we're sorry but it happens to us it happens to everybody so i mean it is part of winter in nebraska and we just have to accept that and move on any other questions for chuck yes sir chuck i uh, talked to a blade uh, the other day, uh, not the other day some time ago and, and the fellow who was running it said something that was logical to me but maybe you can tell me is it logical or to throw cold water on it he said, if the, if the grader doesn't go at a certain speed, the snow will not roll off the blade. That is correct. It you, just you, goes in front of it. That is correct. You, got, you lose your momentum. You got to, it's got to roll off to the side or else it piles up in front of the machine and then you're, you're stuck. Therein lies all of the sidewalks and driveways that you throw that snow That is correct. Right. Just nature of the beast. Right. And if you look at a snow plow, you'll see the angle of it. And that's, you know, that angle's that's the premium angle to move the most snow that they can with that machine, and that's how they're set up. Any other questions? Uh, Chuck, and yes, vehicles sir. should be moved within 24 hours? No, vehicles should be moved within 12 hours of the windrow being put around them. And then typically, you know, you got your 24 hours, you got your 12 hours. If we get around to 24 hours, then the police department, they'll contact us, make sure we've made our rounds if we've been through the whole town and work with us. But typically it's 12 hours after that windrow okay. is around your vehicle it should be moved okay thank you all right chuck thank you very much thank i will you. say i think we did a great job on this last snowfall so please let the fellows know that it's went fairly well and we've had i think this time we actually had more comments and complaints so that was good to hear so good thank you thank you all right we'll move on to public hearings Item 7A, public hearing, consider objections to the creation of the Street Improvement District Number 185, East 14th Avenue from 23rd Street to North Corporate Limits, and the Street Improvement District Number 186, the alley between 15th and 14th Streets and 28th and 29th Avenues. Is there anyone here this evening to speak against this public hearing? Anyone here this evening to speak for this public hearing? Please come forward. My name is Scott Schaefer, and I live at uh, 2819 15th Street. And uh, I share the alley with the Columbus Medical Center, which is the alley that they're considering to pave. And I just want to encourage the city to do it because that is probably, I, I haven't done any studies or anything like that, but it is probably the busiest alley in the entire city. I mean, that Columbus Medical Center, <laughs> there's 50 cars going through that alley every single day. It's just, it's absolutely amazing. I know they did a count on it here last year sometime. They put a thing across the alley. I don't know what the count was. I'm sure you guys do. But um, they're constantly grading it. So that would, you know, go into effect as far as the price, I'd imagine. But Well, on this, the, we're talking about East 14th right now, or are we talking about the alley? Both. We're talking about both. And, and we do move on and, and recommend that it be done. And so I think the, the, the postcard survey was all positive and wanting it to be done. So we, Great. We're, we're making the recommendation at the next, le the next step or two. You're getting ahead of yourself. Well, <laughs> but we're glad, to hear your, we're glad to hear your support. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Anyone else to speak in favor? Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm against the uh, 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 Okay, please come forward. Yes. Okay, please name and address, please. My name is Maria Pedrosa. I'm on the 14, on the 28, 14th Street. Okay. So I have a couple of questions. So they uh, sent a map saying they will be make three roads. I wanna know why they have to make three roads when we didn't need it, we didn't have schools around, we didn't have hospitals. 
we didn't have clinics, we don't have nothing else except just houses. So just I want to know why they want to build three. Mm. I have to pay like around 20,000. So that's why I'm, I'm here for about against that. Rick, do you want to answer? I mean, I can give a brief, but you're probably better at it. Because uh, there, there, there is a reason why it's a three lane, ma'am. So I, yes. I'll let our city engineer try to give you his best explanation <laughs> as he can. Okay. So Rick Bogus, city engineer. So East 14th Avenue is a designated um, arterial roadway. And so um, what we do when we have arterial roadways with the counts of traffics and the trucks that we have is we make those three lane roads. And so it's two, it's one um, lane each direction with a common left hand turn lane. And so this is the same one you've seen um, constructed on Third Avenue South of 8th Street, 33rd Avenue by the school, that sort of thing. So it's the same design pattern. So so it's designated uh, a, this type of road because of traffic counts, because of of the type of traffic on it. I mean, I, I want right. to try to help her understand yep. what's yep. making this all happen. Yeah, that's correct. And it's a state designation. So the state designates it that. And then, of course, we follow that designation. But that's correct because the traffic counts, truck counts, things of that nature. Okay type of traffic too the type of traffic truck type yep. of traffic yep. the because of its designation it then becomes also available for some different funding does it not it does and they're using that to uh, um, federal funds purchase program money and so 80 percent of the cost of the entire project is paid to this um, this FFPP fund and so 20 percent of the project is being assessed to the property owners and the reason we do that is, um, you know, it's not necessarily fair for them to live on the, the street and pay for the wider three lane road, pay for the thicker concrete because of this additional traffic and all that. Um, so um, us paying 80 percent of it and then paying 20 percent of it is a, is a large um, deduction under what it would be if it was just a standard road about maybe three times less. OK, so if this was in town, a, a standard road in town, it what they end up paying with the appropriate uh, percentage that you've laid out there it would be similar in cost or close yes close yep okay now smile you're on candid camera so everybody that's why we have to have you come up how, here. <laughs> how about yes they do uh two roads we didn't mind it we just pay few but it it's like 20,000 I have to pay. So it's like, if they do just two roads, like whatever we have right now, so we can pay less and we can do that. But otherwise, it's a lot of money I have to take out of my pocket and then pay a loan. Well, so. and I think what Rick's trying to, to explain is that the two lane that you're talking about is really about what you're probably paying for, what, what you're yeah. being assessed for is gonna be, is really the same, but you're gonna get the three lanes. So otherwise, the other uh, people just living around, can they pay, help in us to pay it? It is getting, uh, the, the cost of this road does get allocated all the way up it and then back in on the streets that come into it, uh, one or two lots in each way. Yeah. There, there is a formula, ma'am, to address exactly what you're asking. Yeah, it's standard half block back. Mm -hmm. Standard half block back. And that, again, is to try to offset those costs for you on the frontage and recognize that others are sharing in that benefit so there's many of them that would come forward and say well I'm back here and not getting it but you know what you're trying to do is spread that cost to those that are trying or that are getting the benefit out of it understand exactly where you're coming from but there it, 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 there's not anything we can do about that you know well there the 80 that um, yeah, so 80% for it's paid. So, but the um, assessments can be paid over a 15-year um, period if you want to, and so you can spread those costs out over a 15-year period with uh, interest. So it's a it, it, it would be like a loan to us that you could spread out over 15 years. Right. So the city would pay for it all, and then the property owners get assessed according. You could pay up to 15 years, right? Uh, 
Yeah, the city sets a um, interest rate um, when they set as the Board of Equalization, which will be another year or two, but there's an interest rate with that. Okay. That's all right. Are you, are you, you have any other questions? No. I mean, I, certainly want to try to answer anything we can, because yeah, your, your questions are very valid and very common. Please understand, what you're asking are very common questions. Yeah, we want to know about everything, what's mm -hmm. going on. So that's why I just saying we don't have a school, we don't have hospitals, we don't have nothing like exactly we have to have three roads. So we didn't stack uh, cars between, so that's why I, my concern was. So but it, it has been designated that by the state and, and keep in mind your part of the city is really starting to grow. Yeah, so agree. it's also part of the, you know, trying to plan toward the future for, for the community. Okay. 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 Thank you for coming <laughs> forward. <coughs> Anyone else to speak toward this, for or against this public hearing? Mr. Mayor, I recommend the public hearing be closed. We have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by aye. Those opposed, nay. Aye. aye. Oh, hell, we can't do that, can we? <laughs> Heck, we can't do that, can we? <coughs> Augustine Schulte? Aye. Barr? Yes. Hamer? Aye. Jablonski? Aye. Kreeshaw? Aye. Lohr? Aye. Roth? Aye. Schilling? Aye. <clears throat> Motion carries. <laughs> Item 7A1, resolution number R21-14, directing the city to proceed with the creation of street improvement in district number 185. Mr. Mayor, I move resolution number R21-14 be adopted. We have a motion and a second to adopt resolution R21-14. Any discussion? Seeing none, vote. Barr? Yes. Hemer? Aye. Jablonski? Aye. Creeshaw? Aye. Lohr? Aye. Roth? Aye. Schilling? Aye. Augustine Schulte? Aye. All voted aye, motion carries. Item 7A2, resolution number R21-15, directing the city to proceed with the creation of street improvement district number 186. Mr. Mayor, I move for the adoption of resolution number R21-22. Second. R21-15. 15. I take that back. 15. Did we get a second? Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second to adopt resolution R21-15. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify okay. with a roll call. Hemer? Aye. Jablonski? Aye. Kreeshaw? Here. Lohr? Aye. <laughs> Roth? Aye. Schilling? Here. Augustine Schulte? Aye. Barr? Yes. <laughs> all voted aye, motion carries. Item 7B, public hearing authorization of acquisition of various interests in real estate for lift station number seven. Anyone here to speak against this public hearing? Anyone here to speak for this public hearing? Mr. Mayor, I move the public hearing be closed. Second. We have a motion and a second to close this public hearing. I would just like to ask where, what address is Lift Station 7. It's, a okay. it's the one Applebee's on the yeah. right, 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 right along the highway. Yep. Okay. I, I, I've got a question. Something I would like to see on these in the future would be a current close address. Sure. I just Makes think sense. I just think when you go through and look at it and you, I mean, I thought that's where it was, mm -hmm. but wasn't sure. And I really don't know where Block 1, Block A, Yada, 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 yada is. Descriptions, yes, so, I understand. Uh, anyway, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, vote please. Or um, vote please. <clears throat> Jablonski? Aye. Kreeshaw? Aye. Lohr? Aye. Roth? Aye. Schilling? Aye. Augustine Schulte? Aye. Barr? Yes. Hemer? Aye. All voted aye, motion carries. Item 7B1, resolution number R21-16, authorizing acquisition of interest in various tracts of real estate by purchase or eminent domain for lift station number seven. Mr. Mayor, I move for the uh, approval, approval of resolution 2118. 2116. 16. 16. Bar, yep. It's not mine, so this I'm is sorry. Charlie's, yep. 
Mm -hmm. I'm uh, off. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I move for the adoption of resolution number R21-16. Second. We have a motion and a second to, re to approve resolution R21-16. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Creeshaw? Aye. Lohr? Yes. Roth? Aye. Schilling? Aye. Augustine Schulte? Aye. Barr? Yes. Hemer? Aye. Jablonski? Aye. All voted aye. Motion carries. <coughs> Item 7B2, resolution number R21-17, approving purchase agreement with Mountain Tower and Land LLC for real property for lift station number 7. May I recommend resolution number R21-17 be adopted? Second. We have a motion and a second to adopt resolution 21 R21-17. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Lohr? Yes. Roth? Aye. Schilling? Aye. Augustine Schulte? Aye. Barr? Aye. Hemer? Aye. Jablonski? Aye. Creeshaw? Aye. All voted aye. Motion carried. <laughs> Item 7B3, resolution number R21-18, approving the purchase of the purchase agreement, excuse me, with H Properties of Columbus LLC for real property for lift station number seven. Mr. Mayor, I move that resolution number R2118 be adopted. Second. We have a motion and a second to adopt resolution R21-18. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Roth? Aye. Schilling? Aye. Augustine Schulte? Aye. Barr? Yes. He Hemer? Aye. Jablonski? Aye. Creeshaw? Aye. Lohr? Aye. All voted aye. Motion carries. Brings us up to reports of city offices. Um, we have a, in your packet was a memo from the police chief <coughs> indicating we had one, they had one call since our last council meeting. Anyone care to have the chief detail that or is everybody comfortable with that summary? I'm comfortable with it. Okay. Thank you for putting it together, chief. We also had a report from uh, city, uh, our city physician, Kip Anderson, on uh, the status of COVID in, in Columbus. Would you want me to read that, Tara, just to let the public know? If you wish, or if or the council. Is everybody comfortable with Dr. Anderson's summary to us? Uh, was there something in there about the percentage of uh, inoculations made? N only, only said that uh, vaccines are continuing to be administered in the phase <laughs> 1B, which includes over 75 or 65 with significant health problems. Yes, sir. Uh, Taylor Anderson, 3653, 36th Avenue. I'm just curious, so where are we at with compared to that, I think, 50 cases per okay. week rolling average. I should have read it because then that would have told you. Okay. Why don't I just read what Dr. Anderson put together for us? As of January 28th, COVID hospital numbers have remained low with an average of one to two patients in the hospital and currently no COVID patients in the ICU. As of the most recent report from East Central Health District on January 22nd, the rolling seven-day average for Platte County is 31.1 per 100,000 which is where it had been for the approximately the same place for the last month or so. Vaccines continue to be administered, uh, which I had just said, which includes over, those over 75 or 65 with significant health problems. Everyone all right with that? Okay, we'll Get move on home. to reports on legislation. Item 12A, request <clears throat> that city council express support for legislative bill 579 that would change provisions relating to the Department of Transportation reports regarding highway construction and state intent regarding appropriations and legislative bill 542 that would authorize the issuance of highway bonds under the Nebraska Highway Bond Act. Thank you. So the point here for everyone's knowledge is that our Senator, Senator Mosier has put together uh, bill 579 and had it introduced. 579, in a nutshell, would, is asking for $75 million from the general fund. 70. To, 70 million? Mm -hmm. 70 million from the general fund to get transferred into uh, the, the roads and NDOTs in anticipation of federal money getting paid back to NDOT from all that they spent for flood repair, from damages. And the thought is, hey, if they get that money up front, maybe we can finish Highway 30. Maybe we can, because all the delays we're constantly given is based on lack of current funding. So this would be a way to try to get some current funding and not 
a really long-term affect the budget because it's going to get paid back in. Is that, is, Correct. Okay. And then the the bill from from uh, Senator White's from Falls, Falls is from Fremont. 542, right? And um, that bill is would basically allow DOT to bond highway uh, projects. And there's a multitude <coughs> of arguments, but as I wrote in the memo, um, borrowing money right now is in just record lows. And um, the primary argument for the legislature, as far as I've heard when talking to people, is that it's actually cheaper to bond it now and pay for it and start it now with today's construction costs than to wait five to 10 yeah. years. And the escalation in construction costs far exceeds the cost of financing currently, if that makes sense. So our, our intent is to send those senators a, a letter of support so that the legislature will see that we are behind them in these kind of efforts. John, did you have a question? The, uh, the governor has historically been against bonding for highway purposes. Correct. Has he changed his position? Anyway? No. No. And that's why the senators really, they, they know that they can't beat his veto. Yep. They want to make some noise about the highway issues and the delays that continue to happen. And they want to show that there's solutions that the state could be pursuing. And ironically, although the governor is not for bonding, bonding was used for the, the Lincoln Bypass, which is under construction right now. So. So I'm not sure what that says. <laughs> well, that said that the, the contractor was a, taking the, the hit on the, on the cost and hoping that the bond would pay out other than the state having to pay it back. So that, it's a little bit different, but it's still a creative way to do it. I mean, it's still the end, same end result. But we, we do need to do something. And I think the fear with Highway 30 is that they were just going to grade and then stop because that's how much money they had. And then that would mean that whatever they've done up to North Bend could possibly sit vacant for six years. And that is, doesn't make sense. That does not make sense. And that highway keeps getting uh, more and more dangerous every day. And, and so any input you can give to the senators uh, to, to get that $70 million off the ground would be appreciated. All right. New business. Um, we need a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. There's motion to support this. Um, to direct staff to, to. Right, I can read it. A motion to direct staff to send communication to the Appropriations Committee to express support for LB 579 and to the Revenue Committee to express support of LB 542. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. Schilling? Yes. Augustine Schulte? Aye. Barr? Yes. Hamer? Aye. Jablonski? Aye. Creeshaw? Aye. Lohr? Yes. Roth? Aye. All voted aye. Motion carries. New business. Item 13A, quote from Warren Garage Door Incorporated in the amount of $14,038.50 to replace overhead door at the transfer station. Mr. Mayor, I move that the quote from Warren Garage Door Inc. be approved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the quote from Warren Garage Door. Any discussion? I just, Mr. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Why, uh, what justify the $12,000 difference between the two bids? Chuck, I'll call Chuck up for that question. I, yeah, I, I had a question raised also. Uh, why, what is the reason for replacing it? What is, what has caused the need? Chuck Slova, City of Columbus, Director of Public Works. Uh, door number five had failed, pulled apart, and was collapsing. That's why it was an emergency repair. We didn't have a, a line item budgeted for the repair at this time. Uh, I'll just go through it quickly. Uh, briefly, overhead door has a, these type of doors have a lifespan eight to 12 years. Well, we're at the seven year mark and it's starting to fail. Once we started looking at replacement, we always try to get quotes and look into it. Well, this door was an insulated door, 28 foot tall they don't even recommend replacing it as an insulated door at this time. So the first quote we had was $38,000. That kind of set us back in our seats. And well, let's look at some different items here. So if you're familiar with the transfer station, that area is not even heated. Doesn't make much sense to have an insulated door there. And that's part of the problem with this big a door. 
the insulated door is so heavy, the way it's constructed, they're kind of hinged together as it rolls up, the hinges start pulling apart because you have the weight of the insulation, you got the wind load, you got icing, things of that nature, and they're open, you know, every day, six days a week, twice a day. So they were starting to pull apart. So what we did with that, we, we salvaged parts off the number five door and fixed number four because it was starting to do the same thing. And we had to replace number five at this time, which is a non-insulated door. Uh, the price difference, we just, you know, we called, we worked with Warren Door before in Norfolk, and that's the difference we've seen. The insulated door originally was 38,000, then their second bid was 28, and then we come down with a non-insulated door, was uh, 14 from Warren Door, and um, you've seen the price for the uh, 28 for the other, 26, 28 for the other non-insulated from overhead. So we opt to go with Warren Door, and I think the preceding year, next budget, we'll probably look to replace the rest of the doors so this is here. something that uh, the design process was, went uh, went bad what, what it, yeah I was, whoever whoever designed whoever designed a building but put, put uh, insulated doors on an, on a non-insulated building you once know. we started looking into it uh, we had some questions but, and now, you know, that we get the door for this kind, it doesn't make sense to come in and lower the door, make it a 20-foot door, and lose that 8-foot and try to get something better. But uh, the insulated doors, we don't see a need for it. It's not an insulated building. <coughs> yes, Apparently, uh, <coughs> the warranty is over on the door. Yeah, commercial doors. Most projects we do, typically, Rick and Bert, we get a year warranty on most any kind of project that we do. Sometimes we'll get lucky and get a two-year extended warranty or some things, but typically it's a year on any of that. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Yes. Oh, uh, let's vote. Augustine Schulte. Aye. Barr. Yes. Hemer. Aye. Jablonski. Aye. Creshaw. Aye. Lohr. Aye. Roth. Aye. Schilling. Aye. All voted aye. Motion carries. Item 13B, quote from electric pump in the amount of $71,876 for lift station pump view control system for wastewater collection. Mr. Mayor, I move that the quote from electric pump be approved. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the quote from electric pump. Any discussion? Seeing none, let's vote. Barr? Yes. Hemer? Aye. Jablonski? Aye. Creshaw? Aye. Lohr? Aye. Roth? Aye. Schilling? Aye. Augustine Schulte? Aye. <coughs> All voted aye. Motion carries. Item 13C, quote from Corrin, Maine, in the amount of $131,201.80 for a year one of five-year upgrade program of the fixed space meter reading monitoring system for the water utility division. Mr. Mayor, move that the quote from Corrin, Maine, be adopted. <laughs> we have a motion and a second to accept the quote from Core in Maine. Any discussion? I have a question. So that $131,000, is that for just one year or is that for the all five years? That's for one year. Right. So next year we'll be paying another amount, right. is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. Hemer. Aye. Jablonski? Aye. Creshaw? Aye. Lohr? Aye. Roth? Aye. Schilling? Aye. Augustine Schulte? Aye. Barr? Yes. All voted aye. Motion carries. Item 13D, purchase and installation of the VRX repeaters from Electronic Engineering in the amount of $17,578.47 to equip three police vehicles. Engineering amount bid of seventeen thousand five seventy eight and forty seven cents. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the purchase of RVX repeaters from Electronic Engineering. Any discussion? Seeing none. Please vote. Jablonski. Aye. Creshaw. Aye. Lohr. Aye. Roth. Aye. Schilling. Aye. Augustine Schulte. Aye. Barr. Yes. Hemer. Aye. All voted aye. Motion carries. 
Item 13E, plan specifications, estimate of cost in the amount of $3,604,000 for the authorization to advertise for bids for street improvement district numbers 185 East 14th Avenue from 23rd Street to North Corporate City Limits, SID 186, the alley between 14th and 15th Streets and 28th and 29th Avenue, and SID 187, uh, 25th Street from 33rd Avenue from West 140 feet. Plans and specifications are on file in the engineering department. Mr. Mayor, I move that the plan specification and estimate of the cost for the bids for the street improvement districts 185 and 186 be approved. And, and 187. 187. I'm sorry, 187 be approved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the plan specifications and estimated costs for districts 185 186 and 187 any discussion I wanted to just make a public note of some of the comments that were put out in the uh, in the uh, memo from staff because it's the type of thing that will come back to us after construction after a rain because this is an area that's very flat like most of Columbus but it is spelled out in the details that the design of the project is limited due to elevation of discharged storm waters. The street paving and storm sewers will be constructed at the least slope allowed by the city. Therefore, it must be noted that some small areas of shallow storm water ponding may occur in the gutter line and ditches <coughs> along Highway 30. In other words, there's gonna be some pooling of water once in a while because we live in a flat community. You can't grade flat. It is what it is, but I think we need, it's important we say that up front because it's always, those are the kind of comments that always come back to us on why didn't we design it right. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Creshaw? Aye. Lohr? Yes. Roth? Aye. Belling? Aye. Augustine Schulte? Aye. Barr? Yes. Hemer? Aye. Jablonski? Aye. All voted aye. Motion carries. Item 13F, comments from the mayor and city council members. In compliance with the Open Meetings Act, no discussion may be held on this item. Any council members with comments this evening? I have two, if I may, please. Yes, please. Uh, the first one was, uh, the first one I'd like to make is I had a concerned citizen contact me last week, um, one, of our, one of our vets who are retired. Um, expressing some concern about um, people using the handicap parking and uh, just a reminder to citizens that uh, those are even though they're empty sometimes or they appear to be there that they, they may appear that they're not being used they are being used so please show some common courtesy to our um, disabled vets to any of our other disabled citizens by choosing not to use the handicap parking if you are not handicapped uh, the second one that I'd like to point out is uh, we are beginning this week the celebration for Catholic Schools Week in Columbus. And I think Columbus is pretty fortunate. We have an outstanding public education system as well as an outstanding private education available to people in our community. And uh, while our parochial schools are always a choice, we are very fortunate that we have families that make that choice. Uh, just a brief calculation here, it costs almost $10,000 to educate one person in the public school system. We presently have 850 people, 850 students enrolled in our Catholic school system, which means that we are presently saving over $8 million in property taxes because families are choosing to send their kids to a parochial school. And that number would be higher since we don't have the number of uh, Lutheran school kids or the Christian school kids. But our, our uh, parochial school system is a benefit to all of us in this community. They help keep our property taxes down and they still contribute to a, a strong education system in our community. So I commend families for making those sacrifices to any of our parochial schools. And I just thank all of our schools for the work they do and the dedication they have to our, the kids in this community. And that's all I have tonight, thank you. Any other comments? I have nothing this evening. We'll move on to resolutions. Item 14A, resolution number R21-19, amending the schedule of fees to accommodate operations associated with the permitting software. 
Mr. Mayor, move for the adoption of resolution number R21-19. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution 21-19. Any discussion? Please vote. Lohr? Aye. Roth? Aye. Schilling? Aye. Augustine Schulte? Aye. Barr? Aye. Hamer? Aye. Jablonski? Aye. Creeshaw? Aye. All voted aye. Motion carries. <coughs> Item 14B, resolution number R21-20, approving amendment B to the standard agreement and general conditions between owner and the construction manager for the community building project for the temporary library relocation. I move the resolution number R21-20 be adopted. Second. We have a motion and a second to adopt resolution R21-20. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Roth. Aye. Schilling? Aye. Augustine Schulte? Aye. Barr? Yes. Hamer? Aye. Jablonski? Aye. Creeshaw? Aye. Lohr? Aye. All voted aye. Motion carries. <laughs> Item 14C, resolution number R21-21, approving the agreement with Columbus Community Hospital, Inc. for ambulance services. Mr. Mayor, I move resolution number R21-21 be adopted. I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution R21-21. Any discussion? Yeah, I have a question. I, I under, I've read most of it and, and understand there is a need for it. Uh, I, we charge for these and yes. we will oh, yeah. be reimbursed? Yes, yeah. we'll be charging for them. So what happens in the event? That they don't pay? Well, no, not, the, not necessarily them. Uh, if the hospital needs them moved and they don't have insurance or or the hospital need, won't provide a uh, medical necessity form to transfer? The agreement says that if we collect after 90 days where it's uncollectible, we'll bill the hospital. Okay, I didn't, didn't catch that, thank you. That's what I was after. And I think for the public standpoint, it was very clear that this only works when it does not affect any need for the, right. the you know, for rescue to be do, handling any current, any city obligation this only is done when the department is comfortable they can do it right and maintain coverage and maintain. for their community yep. is this short term till they get ambulance service well it's intended to be short term yes so hopefully they'll find alternatives i mean it's probably not a best situation but i think it's a great uh, it's great collaboration when yeah. when we get Trying into a situation it. where we're not really they, they don't have somebody to turn to, and if we can help them out and, and get our costs covered, you know, and, and help, I, I mean, that's probably what it's all about, trying to help and, and serve the citizens. Chief, are we missing something that you wanna? Yeah, you, clarification. <clears throat> um, Dan Miller, Fire Chief. Um, they do have uh, a new contract, uh, private ambulance service in town that they are contracting with, but this, uh, situation arose out of the pandemic and the need to create empty hospital beds uh, in a situation that would benefit the community and allow us to bring people to the hospital again because they had no empty beds and we didn't want to end up with a in LA where uh, ambulances are waiting outside for hours on end for empty beds <clears throat> so uh, it, it also raised the awareness that Maybe we need something like this a little bit ongoing, even though they have a new contractor. What if their ambulances break down or some other situation like this arises in the future? We've got this little card in the back pocket and they do have to call me, call me first, call the fire chief first, get authorization, make sure that that ambulance company is not available during daytime hours. We call off duty, primarily volunteers who need a little extra experience with the EMT uh, duties gives them a little experience as well to go handle it so great thank you chief <coughs> we have a motion and a second to approve r21-21 please vote Schilling aye Augustine Schulte aye Barr yes Hamer aye Jablonski aye Creeshaw aye Lohr aye Roth aye Schilling oh I, I said that sorry <laughs> <laughs> Pass nine to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Motion carries. <laughs> Item 14D, resolution number R21-22, approving permanent drainage easement agreement with Brad S. Luxinger, Christine C. Lushinger, and Todd A. Lushinger for stream improvement district number 185. 
Mr. Mayor, I move for the adoption of resolution number R21-22. I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution R21-22. Any discussion? Please vote. Augustine Schulte? Aye. Barr? Aye. Hemer? Aye. Jablonski? Aye. Creeshaw? Aye. Lohr? Aye. Roth? Aye. Schilling? Aye. All voted aye. Motion carries. Brings us up to ordinances on their third reading. Item 17A, ordinance number 21-04, amending multiple sections of chapter 33 of title three of the Columbus City Code to update and make organizational changes for the fire department. Mr. Mayor, I move for the adoption of ordinance number 21-04. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt ordinance number 21-04. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Barr? Yes. Hamer? Aye. Jablonski? Aye. Creeshaw? Aye. Lohr? Aye. Roth? Aye. Schilling? Aye. Augustine Schulte? Aye. Barr? Or, or, there I guess stop there again. <laughs> All voted aye. Motion carries. Meeting adjourned. We do have a CDA meeting. Oh, that's too, right. So we do have a meeting after this. Don't leave just yet. Yep. So the city council.